Knife crime reached an all-time high in 2019. Now, in 2020, and in the middle of a pandemic, it still shows no signs of slowing down. With America experiencing their problems with gun control and public shootings, would it be fair to say the UK is having a similar problem with knife crime? I'll be meeting up with some of those people and charities who were working on the front line and fighting against this ever-going crisis. In the year ending March 2020, there were around 46,000 offences involving a knife or sharp instrument in England and Wales alone. I start my journey in the northwest of the UK. In October 2020, there were a shocking 22 knife incidents in the Greater Manchester area, making it by far the worst month on record for knife crime in the city. Manchester in the early 2000s was infamously branded Gunchester. Now, 20 years on, gun crime has dropped by up to 60% in the area, just as knife crime starts to spiral out of control. So what's the reason for these shifts in numbers? I managed to chat with Matthew, an ex-gang leader of the famous Rush Home Mandem. Matthew was infamously known as one of Manchester's most feared gangsters in the early 2000s. Group of friends, it's not like you go up one day and think I want to be a gangster, it's just a group of friends, someone from another area hurts your friends, you go back and retaliate, they might bring a knife or bring a gun so you've got to match what they bring and then before you know it you're a gang. Um, selling drugs because my mum was a single mum, we tried her hardest, but dad was a bum, he was never there for us. So my mum can only do so much when you're 12, 13 and you want the nice coats and the nice trainers, that costs and you've got four boys. In 2011, Matthew sadly lost his brother to a knife crime attack when he decided enough was enough. I wasted seven years of my life, my brother's dead, my other brother's been stabbed, I've been shot, seen my mum cry. For what? For a street name? You don't own that house. Let's be real, you don't own that house, so what are we fighting for? A lot to do with its parents, no resources for the kids, this drill music, no role models. Teachers are overrun, social workers are overrun, mental health workers are overrun, and these are looking after our kids' mental and safe well-being. I look at in my era, we had a lot of olders, and a lot of the old olders had respect and had morals. You couldn't hit a woman, you couldn't rape a woman, you couldn't beat up and stab an old person, you couldn't burgle houses. But now, when they took all us off the street and all the older ones, they were left, there was a vacuum, and these kids, they had no guidance, so now these kids, They've got no respect for nobody, so Manchester's just picking up where it left off with us. Matthew continues to push his message in communities and schools. Although he's the next gangster, he now uses his experiences to inspire people to a better life and to make better choices. On the first day I began filming, Lee, not a 45-year-old man from Wivenshaw, was attacked and killed with a knife. The man charged with his murder was just 19 years old. Further details had yet to surface as the knife attack becomes another stat towards the UK's worst year on record. Friends of Lee described him as a great person who would do anything for anybody. In one senseless moment, he lost his life to a knife and his family's lives had now changed forever. Manchester recorded 1,953 knife-related incidents in 2018. 2019 shot up to a massive 3,700. A criminologist from the University of Salford, Dr Anthony Ellis, told me why he believed knife crime is on the rise. I think it's very difficult to identify one particular thing that's behind it. I think that there isn't a kind of an easy answer or an easy solution to the issue. I think there's a multitude confluence of different things that are going on that lead to this happening. Sadly, wasn't long until the next incident would take place, not far from where Lee Knott lost his life. So I just arrived in Moston, on the other side of Manchester. It's only the second day of filming, and we've already witnessed two knife-related incidents. I was informed by a resident that a man was left lying on the floor after a dispute broke out between two vehicles. In the year ending 2018, there were 285 homicides on the streets of the UK. One in four of the victims were men aged 18 to 24. 
it being a strange start in Manchester. After visiting two major incidents in two days alone, the realism of the situation had really started to sink in. So this is where Tommy Bilton unfortunately lost his life at 19 years old. We're in Oldham Town Centre at the moment. Today I'm going to be speaking with his mum and dad to hear his story. It doesn't go away, it never goes away, it does get any easier. We was in bed and uh, we got a knock on the door and I said, oh, he's lost his key again, because Tommy always lost his key. And this young girl, um, she said, um, Tommy's been stabbed. So he went to the party and there was some trouble at the door as he was going in and this lad come running down with two knives and stabbed the lad through the back. And then? And then chased Tommy up the street and when Tommy turned round, he'd stabbed Tommy. Well, we thought he was going to be all right, because yeah. well, he died when he got to the hospital. They brought him back and we thought, oh yeah, he's because alive. Because he was a lad, he trained. They brought him out and they said, right, he's dying. Uh, you, you've got to go in with him. CPS were there, the police were there. He had all of his hand and um, his brother. It was, it was just full of blood all over him, the clothing, the bedding. And it was so cold. It was so cold. And I just couldn't believe it. This lad doesn't know what he's done to us. He stabbed my child once. He stabbed us a thousand times. We've got to live with it every day. It just turns your life upside down, this. It does. Yeah, every night. I mean, we don't talk about it a lot between no, ourselves. We don't talk. It's the first time we've done it. You just don't know what's there. And that's what it does, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, we just... Uh... You still can't look at each other, can you? Just don't know what's Even there. after five years, you don't... You still don't believe it. You don't see five it years like It doesn't... It, it hasn't sunk into our brain, Jack. No. It's hard to accept. All you want is just one more second with him. To hug him, you know, and kiss him. That's all I asked for. That's all. I'd be happy then. Just to hold him one more time. Still, five years on, the Bilton family seek justice for Tommy. I think it's important to take note that knife crime can affect anybody in the UK, no matter of your age, race or gender. How many more families like Tommy's are going to be affected before major changes are made in the UK? With Manchester now sitting second behind London as the worst hotspot for knife crime, I wonder what the public made of it. I'm not surprised, it's a, it's a big urban city. Um, over the last few years, the inequality in the city has gone through the roof. There's a, been a massive expansion of uh, a building in the city and lots of money coming in, what people are feeling left behind. I can imagine it's pretty bad. I mean, like, I think stuff does need to be done about it. And it's, um, it's common knowledge that it's bad here. It's been a lot. It's cheaper nowadays. A lot. I asked what they believed the problems was in our community and whether the police and government were doing enough to tackle them. We had a rioting situation nationwide a few years ago. There were kids up in Salford going robbing Iceland for food. Why are they going robbing food from Iceland at eight, 12 years old? There's obviously a underlying issues behind that, but no, it's all right to just throw statistics and oh, because that's a crime in that area or it's an ethnic group. It's got nothing to do with that. I think the government are taking quite like a harsh approach, like harsher sentences and stuff like that. But I think kids just need help rather than getting threatened by prison and stuff like that. Austerity, conservative government, uh, no support, social work being cut, everything being cut really, there's, there's going to be problems. So what can we do as a community to prevent knife crime? There's only one solution to this problem. It might sound weird to some people in the Bible. The whole of society and parents, uh, friends, uh, primary caregivers, teachers, we all have a responsibility. Do a community role instead of going after the police and enforcing it like that. Trying to help them, what's your situation? Why are you going like that? As I made my way through Manchester, I called with JQ being a victim of knife crime. He'd also admitted to carrying knives in the past. I've carried a lot of things, but I've never used them. I've always carried them as a deterrent. Everyone doesn't just walk down the street with a knife. If you're scared and you think, oh shit, John round the corner's gonna fucking do me in, you're gonna carry a knife. If you walk into the shop for a loaf of bread, you're not gonna carry a knife. So, and it, at the end of the day, if you're fucking Mr. fucking 
Richardson that lives in a mansion, you don't need to carry a knife. But if you live on the estate, you might need a knife. So after speaking with the public in Manchester city centre, I think it's quite obvious that there's a lot of lack of trust between the community and the police. It seems as like there's a lot going on in the area, but not a lot being done to tackle knife crime. There are obviously, like you say, a lot of communities that are very suspicious of the police, fearful of them, and very much anti kind of police, anti authority. Where that comes from, I think, again, um, is possibly to do with a kind of a sort of a breakdown in the relationship. Historically, if we look at sort of the way that the police have sometimes been used by the state, certainly the police, I think, um, have tried very hard, I think, to deal with that. There are attempts to kind of rebuild some of those kind of community relations, but um, I think it's just, it's very, very difficult because of those historic kind of ten ongoing tensions as well. And again, if you look at things like stop and search, for example, um, what studies consistently show us over and over again is that a large proportion of people that are stopped and searched are particular people of a particular ethnic background, young men as well, often. Greater Manchester Police State since stop and search began, there's been a drop in knife related incidents by up to 23%. However, stats, they suggest otherwise. Recent trends in offences around the country have been heavily affected by undercounting in the Greater Manchester Police area. After attempting to contact them throughout the duration of filming, I received no response. Greater Manchester Police failed to record over 80,000 crimes between the 1st of July 2019 to the 30th of June 2020. The head of the police force has since resigned. The knife crime debate more broadly is often very much focused on street-based violence, but obviously we've got to remember that there's obviously violence that takes place in domestic settings as well, which women uh, in particular and children are often, most often the victims of as well. Hiya, you all right? Nice to meet you. Sarah, a 28-year-old woman from Sheffield, was enjoying a weekend away with her best friend of 17 years. Unexpectedly, the night took a horrifying turn for the worst. It's not the prettiest of stories, don't get me wrong. For me, it's just like, sounds stupid this, but it was like a learning curve for me that I need to pick better friend. Like I said, I'd got the weekend off, so I thought, oh, I'll just go see her. You know, she's my best friend. She's been my best friend for 18, 17 years, so I'll go see her. We went shopping and we decided we were going to have a little drink on the night time, so we went and bought a lot of alcohol. We went through so much alcohol that night, and one thing led to another, and we ended up in the bedroom, naked, and she turned around to me, she was like, oh, can I tie her up? And at this point, I'd had so much to drink, I was up for anything, so I just said yes. So she tied me up and she carried on doing her thing and then she got off and she went, oh, I'll be back in a minute, went out of the room. I mean, now I, I presume it was to the kitchen because she come back with a knife. And at first I didn't see the knife. <clears throat> the first I knew was when I felt a pain in my leg. I went to grab the knife by the blade and I've got little scars on my hand where I went to grab it. And I genuinely thought, this is where it ends. She stabbed me 18 times. And then when she stopped, she stood at the bedroom door, looked at me and said, I'm sorry, princess. Obviously she thought I was dead at this point. So her brother-in-law got a taxi from his house. And when he got there, obviously I, I was still alive. So he rung an ambulance and the police. So my chest was bleeding. So we held a towel above my chest until the ambulance got there. I always took life for granted. I thought, nah, I'm 24, I can do what I want. And now I realise just how quickly your life can end. I always thought it was young kids in gangs or drug dealers. And then obviously when it happened to me, it just made me realise that it doesn't matter where you grew up or 
where you're from, what race, gender, sexuality you are. If something bad is going to happen, it's going to happen. I'll forgive her, but I'll never forget. Because if I hold a grudge against her, I've constantly got some sort of malice against her and she's not a part of my life anymore. I've moved on. I'm 28 years old. I'm too old to be holding grudges. Although Sarah had gone through a terrifying night, luckily she managed to survive after being left for dead. To be attacked by a stranger is one thing, but to be stabbed 17 times by someone you consider your best friend is unimaginable. Sarah told me the attacker received life in jail and will serve a minimum of seven years. For something so horrifying, it was hard not to question the sentence. Manchester records over nine knife crime incidents a day. However, this seems to be only one place at the heart of the knife epidemic, London. London's a very polarised city. It's a city with, with that within it are some of the richest people in the world. They've got property, you know, they've got interest there. But alongside that, you've also got extreme forms of poverty and disadvantage as well. Um, so it's a real city of contrasts. London has three times the amount of knife incidents compared to England and Wales put together. In the year ending 2019, there were 145 people murdered in the capital. 90 of those was knife related. I wanted to get the public's opinion on the matter. I made my way into Croydon, which is said to be the worst place in London for knife crime. Off camera, I was told it was a touchy subject in the area. However, the one person I did manage to speak to was a victim of knife crime. I know loads of people that's been stabbed, that have been stabbed in my face. Uh, it's getting ridiculous, really, isn't it? I was standing on the side of the road, I was with a couple of people, my people left me, and then out of nowhere, I just literally I just got slashed in the face and I was on the floor. It's, it's ridiculous, that like, obviously, that's one theory I've got is don't carry a knife, because obviously people carry knives to protect themselves. It's not that they're going out trying to stab people, they just want to carry a knife to protect themselves. And when someone confronts you and you both got a knife, one of you's going to have to use it. So that's why I think there's a lot of knife crimes, because a lot of people do carry knives just to protect themselves and then end up in a situation where they're facing life in jail for nothing. You've got large numbers of predominantly young people who are marginalised, excluded, lack opportunities. It's also reduced the number of youth services as well. So we know that, you know, obviously some of these knife related offences have involved young people and a lot of it's been concentrated in some of the big cities. So there's questions about to what extent austerity and the reduction in, you know, services for children and young people and in education has possibly had an effect on this. A charity based in Croydon Lives Not Knives focuses on trying hard to educate the youth and offer positive alternatives to knife culture. So I was arrived at Lives Not Knives in Croydon City Centre. Pretty shocked by it, to be honest. Uh, the amount of stuff they've got, the space, table tennis for children, different games, merchandise. And I think it's just a good place where the kids can come and chill. It's all down to prevention, so we're going into primary schools and secondary schools to um, prevent knife crime. So before a child picks up a knife and does the stabbing or gets involved in gangs, we're trying to prevent that. So when they get to 16 and in the adolescence that they know what's right from what's wrong and that isn't the normal route to go down. Anyone know why we're here first? So you can all achieve what you would like, and this is what me and Stephen are there for, so you know how to reach them goals. It's definitely normalising yeah. for the youth to be carrying knives. There's been examples of yeah. um, kids in year four that were coming across with um, one boy bought a machete to store so when he was in year nine, four. Eight, 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 eight years old. Because he was scared of the bus, he was scared getting the bus by himself, so he bought a machete to store with him. I feel like a lot of kids in youth so they feel like if they're not in a gang, they don't have a sense of belonging, or they don't fit in. Or that you're even unsafe, yeah. that you yeah. don't want to travel anywhere because you think, oh, if I haven't got the protection of these people around me, I can't even go down that road. Literally. 
This is where we go back to, it's hard to try and tell an 18 year old who's so deep in gang life to, oh, it's not the right choice. But to them, it's everything, like that's their entire life. Um, so this is why if we can work in primary schools and stuff, that hopefully when they get to that age, it, it fizzles out a little bit. Obviously our, our hub that we have here is just like, it's a space for them to, to be rather than on the streets. That's essentially why we have this space open as well. It was like every single day on the front of newspapers, this person's been stabbed, this person's been killed. I wanted to kind of raise awareness on knife crime, the impacting factors, the socio-economic backgrounds that these young people come from. We're getting increasing amounts of support. Obviously, knife crime's a very hot topic at the moment. I think 2018, 2019 were especially bad, really bad. It's really bad. Worst on record. So one of the reasons why it upsets me that the government are having these sort of approaches to cutting youth work qualifications in general is that they assume that it's not skilled work and they're basically inferring that most people could do it. But I think if, until you actually sit in one of the sessions and you hear how you, these youth workers work with young people, then you get an appreciation that most people can't do it. You need to be, build a relationship with a young person. Croydon has seen a slight decrease in the last year, which may show charities and mentor systems like this are having a positive impact on the community. I wonder why more centres like this weren't being made available up and down the country. It seemed like it was going to take a lot more from local councils and governments to make this a possibility. Despite charities in the area focusing on the youth, on my way back to the hotel, I found out that a 59-year-old man was murdered on Hadley Road. Upon arrival at the scene, I discovered the man had been stabbed and beaten to death, with a murder investigation being launched. It'd been a tough start in London, with communities doing the best to prevent knife crime, I managed to speak to someone who had a different solution to the problem. My name's Craig Morris. I'm the founder of Spartan Clothing, um, which is a brand of stab and slash resistant, very important word, clothing. This thing is lethal, and I mean lethal. A four-year-old with that knife just doing that action to you will take this knife all the way through your body to your spine. And this is part of the reason we'll get onto why kids are dying on the streets, because they have no idea um, of the simplicity of a knife wound. So this is, this is a mix of polymer fibres. Each fibre mix is stronger than steel at its base level. Okay, so this is a, uh, like a latex foam pad. So if I take a knife and I stab it, we don't get penetration, do you see that? But what we do get is we get, you see, you see the blunt trauma? So that knife is going into this flesh representation about that far. So what's gonna happen during this, and this is why we use the word compromise, so believe me, God, if you've ever seen any of my videos, I'm the person getting stabbed and it hurts and it hurts a lot because of course what you're getting is you're getting a blunt cushion trauma that then impacts into your body. Now if it is a bone, good chance it will break it. If it catches a rib, good chance it will break it. If it hits soft tissue, you're going to get hemorrhaging and you're going to get serious, serious bruising because trust me, I've been black and blue. But what I've not been is I've not been stabbed. You know, so you, you see on, on if you've read any of our media, this, this stuff is designed to get you home. It's not designed to stop you getting injured because nothing will. But that has gone into my desk. Do you see that? And that is the amount of penetration from a razor sharp, and I made this knife myself, a razor sharp bowie knife. This, this actually has cut resistant material in the arms because if you're going to get slashed, you're going to get slashed in, in your limbs nine, nine times out of ten. And it's got stab material into the torso. If I, if I take that knife, that's just a jacket. One of the things we are trying to do is, is that this is a not-for-profit, so we don't make money from this. And these clothes are as cheap as we can possibly make them, because you can imagine the complexity and the cost of doing this. And I'm making garments from scratch for very low quantities. Um, so the point is that if we can make them and if we can save a life, anything that comes back from this, we have a commitment to invest into community centres and into community work because this is the point where people don't know and the police have failed in this but this is where there is going to be a point of difference made because if you can engage with these intelligent valuable young people and they are you need to speak to these guys because people say they're a bunch of scrotes out on the street going out to stab and rob people couldn't be more wrong they are not going out to commit murder they are going out to settle beef at the end of one of these with no idea of the consequences of their actions None whatsoever. So education and engagement is the way through this. You can't police it, you can't give longer sentences because if the kids don't know what they're doing in the first place, none of that stuff applies. 
The following morning, I headed to East London to meet Courtney, the founder of Binning Knives Saves Lives charity. As I was waiting for him, a local shop owner told me he'd witnessed a stabbing earlier in the week. Well, they were chasing them outside. They're trying to cut it here, then they went inside. I was told a teenager was chased by a group into the shop and stabbed several times. Luckily, he survived. What we was looking at was the horrific scenes of the attack. Knife crime was clearly common in the East London area. However, there were several people in the community doing their bit to prevent it. How are you? Courtney was just one of those. Off his own back, him and his team go out onto the streets and collect knives. We started this last uh, May 2019, was our first event. Yeah. And we've been going every week or two since. In January 2019, Jaden Moody was murdered in Leighton. Okay. Uh, it was literally around the corner from the house. And, um, just so much going on, I feel that nobody's doing anything. So us, the communities, if we can get up and try and do what we can. Do you feel like you're getting enough help from sort of the government or councils to enough push help it? from councils. Uh, we don't get any help from anyone. No government, no council, none of them. Knives are sort of quite widely available in the way that like firearms are simply are. So, you know, it, it's, they're an, a household item that we use, you know, in, in our daily lives, preparing food, you know, and, and doing other kind of like, you know, DIY tasks, for example, like Stanley knife and things. So yeah, they, they are sort of widely and quite easily accessible. And even for sort of like young people, you know, it can be it can be quite easy for them to just simply go into a kitchen drawer, pull one out, put it in their pocket and take it out. With them. Yeah, this is the, just to show you the kind of thing we get. Yeah. Wow, people are just carrying these on. Yep. Someone needs to do something about it, you know. But we can only do so much as a community, but we really need the authorities to step up and do what we're voting them in for to protect us. We need to be protected and feel safe on our streets, you know. There's hardly any police. There's probably more knives on our streets than there are police officers. Courtney is doing everything off his own back. He's getting no help from the councils or government, no funding. And I think him going out on the streets collecting knives is doing a lot for his community. As I was packing up and ready to leave East London, a local radio DJ, Michael, stopped by and shared his thoughts. You'll be surprised that a lot of people out there and a lot of the kids that have got knives are only carrying knives because they're scared. And they're scared and they're worried and they're worried that they're gonna get hurt. So it's at the end of the day, isn't it? You just, you're probably just defending yourself and it's a sad fact that some, some of them will defend themselves and may end up killing someone and may end up losing the rest of their life and end up in jail. And if you're not caring for no one and people are looking at saying then, you know, don't care for me, what am I gonna do? I have to care for myself, you know? And it's that world, isn't it? Survival of the fit. As Michael said, he seems to be the survival of the fittest, with government and police turning their backs on certain areas. Too many people are losing their lives to senseless acts. So um, it's not a joke. If you don't value your life, think of your mum. I always tell kids that if you don't think about you, think of your mum, think of your little brother. Because there's always someone out there that's going to cry and going to miss you. And once you're gone, I'll say to the kids, what do you think your friends are going to do? You'll get put on a t-shirt, you get put in a song, they'll smoke a spliff for you and you forgot about. It's clear to me that the knife epidemic continues to run rampant through our cities. Children as young as eight are taking knives into school for fear for their own safety. Communities are doing the best to try and tackle this, however I feel further help is needed. This is the time for the government to change its course, start putting more funding into these communities and charities doing a bit to tackle knife crime. As we've established, things can be done, however the first time they do pick up that knife, could be the last.